Ласкаво просимо, шановні учасники, науковці, політики та практики на наш вебінар. Ми раді бачити всіх вас сьогодні на цій важливій події. Welcome esteemed participants, scholars, policymakers and practitioners to our webinar. Today we gather in a collective effort to shine a light on the in indispensable role that academic institutions play in bolstering communities during challenges times. And our webinar is hosted and organized by web to learn for the Agile project. Uh, Agile project is uh, higher education resilience in a refugee crisis, forging social, social inclusion through capacity building, civic engagement and skills recognition. And I would like to sincerely thank the organizers of this webinar on behalf of the esteemed web to learn team who are today with us, Katrina Juru and Stefania Ekonomou for the opportunity to be the moderator of this webinar. The challenges we faced um, manifold, but so are the opportunities for growth, learning and solidarity. Through today's discussions, we aim to empower, empower academic institutions to not only serve a beacons of knowledge, but also a, um, a sanctuaries of support and integration for those who need this support but strengthening the fabric of our societies to enhance academic solidarity. We are building a more resilient, equitable and inclusive future for all, especially in times of adversity. Uh, let's embark on our uh, on this journey with uh, open minds, com compassionate hearts and a steadfast com commitment uh, to making a tangible difference uh, uh, in the lives of those who look to uh, to ask for support, guidance, and the chance to rebuild their futures. We prepared some polls for you that will appear on uh, our uh, on your screens uh, throughout the webinar. And uh, uh, I would like to start from the first poll. And uh, please uh, answer one question. Have you been part of any academic support networks, initiatives, uh, or uh, during the crisis? And I will share the results and I'm very grateful for everyone. I see that, yes, uh, it was very helpful and uh, uh, it's great to have such audience today with us. So uh, I would like to um, to share the results. Uh, and after this, uh, let's continue our introduction part. So uh, to start, I would like to tell you a few words about the Agile project. The overall goal of our Agile project is to increase the resilience of inclusive higher education institutions uh, in addressing the current uh, needs of refugees through the social participation and skills recognition in their educational pathways. To achieve this goal, we formulated several specific objectives and through our efforts, and collaboration with partners, we hope to achieve these specific objectives and contribute to the sustainable integration of refugees into our higher education institutions and society at large. In our JAL project, we have the honor of collaborating with the distinguished, uh, distinguished uh, partners from various European countries. Our partners are recognized leaders in the fields of higher education, research, and social innovation development. And uh, I also have uh, the honor to, of introducing our invited speakers. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, an esteemed uh, uh, speakers, uh, among which we uh, 
honored to have uh, Dr. Evgenia Polishchuk join us, a uh, pivotal figure in academic and scientific support. Uh, and uh, Evgenia is a co-founder of the Ukrainian Science Diaspora, and she has notably contributed as a wise head uh, um, of the Young Scientists Council at the Ministry of Education and Science in Ukraine and has learned uh, her exp expertise as a United Nations expert during uh, last years. Uh, next, uh, we welcome uh, Kurt Nielsen, a luminary in the JAL and Lean methodologies, and with a rich and engineering background, uh, Kurt has held roles as a system architect and so uh, in IT product companies. Uh, for over 15 years, he has dedicated himself to teaching and coaching on agile and lean practice uh, practices, uh, particularly Scrum, uh, to organizations globally. His expertise as a frequent speaker and writer had a unique perspective to our webinar. And uh, the third speaker is Ludmila Holava. Join us with her expertise in fundraising, grants, and financial literacy. Um, uh, her contributions to the field have been profound uh, and uh, offering of uh, critical knowledge and skills that uh, resonate well with uh, our theme of fostering resilience and support in time of crisis. Before we, uh, before the first speech prepared by Evgenia, I would like to propose you to answer one question. It is our second poll, uh, which will now appear on your screens. Uh, please uh, click on your answer and I will share the results. As you can see, most of you think that the, the major barrier is, the biggest barrier is uh, lack of information. And I think that uh, today's event, uh, like our webinar, is very useful to know uh, more about opportunities, about some initiatives, and uh, we, will, we will inform uh, about our upcoming webinars and um, it will be interesting for you. So let's uh, go to our, let's move to our first speaker, Evgenia Polishchuk. And uh, Evgenia, the floor is yours. Hello, everyone. I'm very happy to be here. And thank you very much for the invitation. And uh, I expect for a fruitful uh, discussion afterwards. And uh, right now, let me share my screen. And I'm going to speak about uh, the Ukrainian Science Diaspora Initiative. And this initiative uh, was uh, set up uh, by the Scholar Support Office, the Young Scientists Council at the Ministry of Education and Science in Ukraine, NGO Innovative University, and uh, our strong partner, the Ministry of Education and Science in Ukraine. So several words about myself. Uh, I'm a co-founder of the Ukrainian Science Diaspora Initiative, and I think that soon we will call we will call ourselves like global Ukrainian Science Diaspora because we are extending and uh, more new communities uh, appear in different uh, countries. So I'm right now I'm Fulbright Visiting Scholar at uh, MIT, and I will be here till May uh, 2024. And uh, I'm a professor at Kiev National Economic University as uh, Katerina Bochenko as well. And well, I am a deputy head of the Young Scientists uh, Council of the Ministry of Education and uh, Science in Ukraine in 2020 and 2023, just uh, the years of COVID-19 
and uh, years of the war. So I can uh, call myself like crisis manager and uh, in advocacy of uh, early career researchers. And I also have an expertise uh, in United Nations uh, uh, for small and medium enterprises development. So what is Ukrainian science diaspora? How we started it? So um, at the beginning of the war, together with uh, Warsaw University, Polish Academy of Science and uh, SGH, uh, uh, we have conducted a research uh, about uh, uh, professional challenges, preferences, plans for Ukrainian uh, researchers abroad. And the results showed us that uh, half of the scientists are going to stay uh, at the host countries uh, because of the re uh, different reasons. And first of all, this is a security reason, which is also uh, make point and uh, make place in uh, such similar uh, surveys. And uh, we also understand that uh, these people want to keep in touch uh, with Ukraine and they want to support Ukraine. And we understood that after COVID-19, uh, we developed uh, ourselves in uh, terms of remote working. So that's why we understood that Ukrainian scientists can be helpful for Ukraine, not only in Ukraine, but um, far abroad. We also conduct, uh, conducted a consultations with uh, the similar communities, communities, I mean, of science diaspora, and our first uh, part, now it is a, it's our partner, was Czech Spots in Science, so this is a, a science diaspora of uh, Czech Republic uh, scientists, and uh, they gave us very valuable recommendation how to uh, start this activity. And uh, here at the photo, you can see uh, myself uh, and other Ukrainian scholars in diaspora. This is Michael Leskiv and uh, Julia Kucharenko, who are MIT representatives, and uh, they supported us with the uh, digital uh, development of Ukrainian science diaspora, the diaspora platform. So what's the main idea of Ukrainian science diaspora is to consolidate the efforts of Ukrainian scholars from different uh, ways of migration for further reconstruction and development, and as well uh, for uh, better integration of Ukrainian scholar scholars into the global research communities. Among our main actions are the building communities, and I'll tell you a little bit more about this, of Ukrainian scientists abroad. This is also mentorship programs. This is uh, The idea is um, supporting of Ukrainians to Ukrainians, and also science uh, diplomacy, which is very important uh, nowadays uh, as uh, representatives, as uh, ambassadors of Ukrainian scientists abroad. And this is also searching a rebuilding project in Ukraine. Their Ukrainian sciences from diaspora can be helpful. So uh, Ukrainian science diaspora in 2023 looks, uh, looked like this. Uh, so we collected and uh, we supported the creation uh, of 15 Ukrainian scholars communities from 12 countries in Europe and America. And here you can see the list of that countries. Uh, we also have a mapping as a tool of uh, at our web um, page and uh, it unites 184 scientists right now from different countries. And uh, we have also informal chat for communications and every day the number of the participants of this chat is increasing and right now it's more than 900 participants. And then we started our platform, then we officially opened it and it was in uh, October 2023, uh, we had more than 400 participants registered and we have more than uh, 6,900 uh, sites visitors at the day of presentation. So you can see here our network. Uh, this is the Ukrainian science diaspora in Poland, France, Luxembourg, Sweden, uh, Czech Republic, uh, Switzerland, Spain, uh, Germany, several associations, uh, Austria, Portugal, uh, Brazil, and we also uh, started to accept uh, uh, not geographically focused uh, countries uh, and societies, I mean, but also uh, which are related to some certain area. So, for example, we have here interdisciplinary scientists work vision, Ukraine, education, language and migration. And I also can announce uh, the joining of the organization related to um, um, bioinformatics. Uh, so this is Ukrainian scientists who um, joined uh, abroad uh, to support Ukrainian scientists uh, in Ukraine.
So as a map, as, as I mentioned, we can uh, you can also see and uh, easily reach a person uh, with whom you'd like to uh, communicate. And for example, here is this Olena, uh, Anna Olenenko, and here is her ORCID profile. And here also we can see when she left, just to understand if she is a newcomer, at this diaspora community or no. And also you can see where did she go and uh, uh, from what uh, field of science uh, she is. And also you can apply for filters and uh, you may filter by countries and you may see uh, how many Ukrainians uh, are in these countries and what they are doing now. Um, a few words about our founders. As I told you, this is NGO, uh, Innovative University, the Young Scientist Council uh, in the Ministry of Education and Science, Personal Ministry of Education and Science and Scholar Support Office. A Scholar Support Office uh, has emerged as uh, um, has appeared as emergency response uh, uh, for um, needs and problems uh, of Ukrainian scientists. And uh, together with Irina Dikhtirova, who is, uh, I, I saw her, she was present here, uh, we conducted that research that I mentioned you about. So, and we did a lot of uh, facilities uh, in sharing uh, the op opportunities uh, for Ukrainian scholars uh, who uh, are considered at risk. So, we have also partners like MIT, it's a technical partner of Science for Ukraine. I think you know all Science for Ukraine. This is also a twinning organization and core consultancy group uh, who unite Ukrainian universities with British universities and again Czech expats and uh, migration, migration organization, uh, Women in Movement. This is a cost uh, project who shared um, the information about our activities more in, than in 15 countries. So uh, what we are going to do in 2024, we uh, split our activities in Ukraine and abroad. And let's talk about uh, Ukraine. So uh, we are going to facilitate a new partnership between host and home universities in Ukraine. Uh, and uh, we are quite successful in it. Uh, we are developing a recommendation of Ukrainian science diaspora for home, home universities, how to cooperate with it. Because for uh, Ukrainian universities, uh, the, science uh, in diaspora, they are not the new one, but uh, um, there were not such a lot of numbers of such people who would like to, uh, to uh, communicate and uh, uh, make a partnership with uh, Ukrainian universities. And uh, we are going to sign in a memorandum of understanding between Ministry of Education and Science in Ukraine and Ukrainian diaspora in different countries. And uh, this is also the sign of uh, from the Ukrainian science side that uh, no one uh, forget about uh, those who left Ukraine because of war. Uh, because of war, and what we are going to do outside Ukraine. So we are becoming bigger, and uh, now we are started a consultation on sustainable development of scientific communities established with uh, International Science Council, all European academies. International Organization of Migration and UNESCO, just to, to support our movement and just to make us uh, visible. We also started fundraising for Ukrainian scientific communities because uh, uh, all these activities, uh, they uh, need uh, not only organizational uh, support and also wish to support, but also uh, financial support. And uh, we're starting to develop uh, science diplomacy. Science diplomacy is very important in order to um, reach uh, uh, the audience uh, and in order to um, tell the real situation in Ukraine, uh, just to broke uh, the myths of uh, Russian propaganda, what's going on in U Ukraine right now, uh, because they are very strong. And uh, um, before yesterday, I have a discussion uh, with a French show. Uh, uh, colleague, and it was a rather interesting discussion about should we consider Ukrainian scholars as Ukrainian scholars at risk, or should we consider Ukrainian scholars at, uh, as a scholars in exile? So, uh, on the re replying on this answer, I can tell that uh, our nation, Ukrainian nation, they are all in at risk. So scholars are also at risk. So uh, every day our cities are bombed and. Uh, Several days ago, uh, Odessa, which is a uh, southern western part of Ukraine, was bombed, and uh, there was uh, five uh, children' uh, lives uh, 
just uh, let down and it's it's really a very sincere story and if we are talking about about science in ex exile scientists in exile so we have a large number of displaced universities we have a large number of displaced uh, scientists uh, from occupational territories so and they are considered science ex in exile because they moved because uh not because of uh, safety reason but I mean, because of safety reasons, but because they do not want to support occupational regime of Putin. So science diplomacy right now is very important. And there is a lot of different uh, ways of development of uh, this science uh, diplomacy work in this. And uh, here you can see uh, our web page map, uh, my contacts, and as well, you can see uh, the QR code on the platform and you right now can uh, uh, register there if you are representative of Ukrainian science diaspora. Uh, we are inviting you and also our telegram chat, uh, which I told you, this is very informal chat. And um, one, the last thing that I want to say, you know, at the beginning of the war, at the internet, there was a document, Google spread, spread sheet document. I don't, I, I don't know who created this. And there were more than 2,000 positions for Ukrainian scientists who could apply for uh, these opportunities and uh, to uh, be accepted of different universities. And uh, this was the document showed us that uh, scientist community is a smart community, which does does not don't need um, to be um, coordinated by someone. So it's like you know someone created Google spreadsheet and it was shared just between colleagues. And it was also the sign of a huge support and solidarity for Ukrainian uh, scientists. And uh, I think uh, we will never forget about this. You see so and. If we are talking about roof estimation, uh, how many people left Ukraine? This is like 5,000 and two and a half thousand were proposed. It's just 15% for covering this. Yeah, so I mean, uh, my personal gratitude to all international community who supported uh, Ukrainian in this uh, difficult time and who continue to do this. Right now, we need not only support, but we need a partnership. We want to show you that we own, we want um, like both sides uh, cooperation. So we can also contribute uh, in our common project and uh, in your culture, academic culture as well. So right now I'm going to stop. Thank you very much uh, for the invitation and I'm happy to discuss uh, other uh, parts uh, also of uh, our presentation. Thank you, Evgenia, so much for your impressive presentation. I'm sure our audience has questions for you, but we will conduct a Q&A session after our speakers have finished. Of course, if you have any questions, you can also write them to the chat. And uh, our next speaker is Kurt Nielsen, but before, before he will start, I would like to push uh, the third poll. Uh, because his presentation uh, uh, will be about freedom of choice. And we have one question about uh, freedom of choice in academia during crisis. So please choose your answer. So we can see that uh, uh, the majority of participants consider a lack of community and solidarity as the biggest barrier uh, to fostering resilience and freedom of choice in academia during crisis. So uh, let's start. Let's move on to our next presentation. Please go to the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I hope you can you can hear me. And um, we had a little bit of a problem getting on here, but here we are. And uh, I'm coming from a different angle because I'm not really in academia uh, at the moment. 
but uh, the connection here is that we have been trying to support uh, Ukrainian uh, educational institutions with uh, teaching the things that we can do. We can't buy 155 millimeter shells for you, uh, but we can uh, try and, and, and convey some of that information that we have. Now, I, I, from the cameras that are on, I think there's only my uh, uh, dear colleague, Christian from Norway, who is here. Uh, the rest of you probably cannot remember, uh, but 50 years ago, uh, there was a song called Me and Bobby McGee, and it was um, it was sung by uh, the tragic character Janis Joplin, and she said, freedom's just another word for nothing left to lose. Now, that's a fairly pessimistic outlook, and I would like to swap it and say, no, freedom is just another word for something we cannot afford to lose. We cannot afford to lose it in... In the, at the national scene, which of course we see playing out in Ukraine right now, with, uh, but also in organizations. And that's that's where we are trying to come from. So I'll try and give you a quick tour of the things that we are trying to um, convey to Ukrainian students and MBA students and other participants. So um, let me just see if I can move this around so that hopefully you can see my screen and um yeah we, so we are trying to build a resilient and sustainable organization and that doesn't really say whether it is a academic organization or a business but we have mostly been focusing on businesses we have however uh, done a lot of um, work also for educational institutions we believe that in order to have resilience and sustainable you have to push authority as far out as you can find people who can carry it, and you have to grant freedom to people. Freedom is at the at the very core of this. We call ourselves Agile Lean House because we we um, we we work on agile and lean principles, and we normally say that our vision is to help people get more effort, sorry, more value out of their efforts, and we do that by educating. We hold courses, we do training, we assist, support, coaching, and we build tools. And um, it's all based on the values that you can find in Scrum and Agile Lean Leadership. So normally when we present this, the case for this, and we, we present this for business people or administrators at universities, say, what are the challenges today? What are the challenges? And let's forget about the, the really big ones like the war, but the challenge is that here's our boss saying, here's a goal, my friend, here's a bike, get on it and get on with it. How hard can it be? And that's how, that's his mental picture of how to accomplish this. The poor guy on the bike, however, does understand that it's probably more like this. So when he starts, he has no idea that there might be a boat ride involved in the journey as well. And um, that is actually the root cause of many conflicts in organizations that we have these two opposing views. And everything is just changing at an accelerating pace. Technological, globalization, consolidation, uh, pressures, the smaller players. And of course, the unknown, sometimes in the form of disasters like war or pandemics, then they hit us. And that puts a very, very high demand on everybody who works there because we have to be able to constantly change and learn. And we have to be able to work in teams to pool our knowledge and re-team for transient teams when something happens. And often we can't just rest with one speciality, one expertise area. We have to be able to more things. And it certainly also puts a great demand on leadership because it's very hard to plan ahead when you don't know there is a boat ride. And um, these are complex situations. What does that mean? That means we have only fragmented knowledge of reality, but we have to do something anyway. There are also the case, certainly here in, in the West where we are comfortable. I'm sure there are greater demands in Ukraine at the moment, but people demand more socially of the workplace. And after the war, when your people have perhaps to find into uh, working also uh, with Western organizations, that becomes that becomes something as well you need to know about. The people want to have autonomy, to scope, to grow and master their skills. 
And if you start to build businesses when the when the war is over, you are in a startup situation, and people will want these things as well. And um, as Winston Churchill said, it's wise to look ahead, but difficult to look further than you can see. Be all of this here leads to uh, that people do not have a realistic picture of reality, those who have to make decisions. In the traditional way, what happens is that we have a hierarchy and here's uh, our designer lady has has drawn this up. And what happens here is at the bottom, there is open fire and panic. And he reports up to the next person, his boss. And uh, he says, oh, yeah, yeah, there's smoke. So there must be a fire. And he reports falls to the next one. So there's hints of fire, but who's ha hints of smoke? Who says it's a fire? It could be the neighbor grilling sausages. And one step up looks fairly relaxed. And at the top, the sun is shining and we are putting fruit in the safe. That is called green shifting. The higher you get up the organization, the more green everything looks because we please upwards. We try to please our boss. So we shift. It's not that we outright lying, but we certainly tweak the truth a little bit. And therefore, quite often the people who have to make decisions don't have the right information. And... Uh, that's really from a Japanese, that means go to the real place and see, Genshi Genbutsu, it's from Toyota. We need to create a place where people can see reality. We can, for example, use the Gallup Q12 to measure people's engagement. The first question is the most important one. Do I really know what's expected here? And Gallup has done that for 25 years. And um, what we learn from that is that the global workforce is not engaged. We need to create environments that can engage people. And uh, Western Europe is actually at an all-time low. Very scary. And uh, one of the graphs that came out of this Gallup investigation was that we have these big numbers. If people are engaged, the, the, the companies that were at the 25% highest compared to the lowest, they had all these problems at much lesser degree. Absenteeism, people wanting to leave, things disappearing from the warehouse, safety incident, patient quality, and much positive things on productivity and productivity. So investing in people's engagement is something that really, really pays off. That's got good evidence for that. And therefore, that is why we try to teach the students that they can do that, that they can create a different type of organization. We call it an, a constitutional organization where there is a freedom under the rule of the law, not under the law of the ruler. And we found some parallels between also Ukrainian society and our Scandinavian society, where freedom exists for people to contribute where people together can be choose to be sustainable and resilient and where leadership is a service and not a privilege. So that's that's where we are heading. Um, when you operate, you, you perhaps have learned from Lean that uh, you can use this learning loop, plan, do, study, act. Okay, you plan the best you can, you do the best you can, you study what you've done and you try to come up with improvements, act. Good old Deming was the one who fathered this one. But in times of crisis, we have to move faster. There's a tactical element. And there's something that we also try to teach people is the OODA loop, that, which is a more complex one, actually comes from the military. And I do know from a fact that your military in Ukraine uses this one. But what we go through the four phases of observe the environment, orient, decide, and act. But sometimes we can... When we orient, we view the world through our cultural lenses and our background and everything. And sometimes we can immediately, spontaneously go back and look for more observation or immediately, spontaneously, intuitively react uh, and uh, in implicit guidance and control. And that's where the fast moving environment and we try to teach people how they can use it in a competitive situation, but also how they can support each other by by enhancing each other's OODA loop. 
that's just to give you an example. It, the time is too short to go into detail with this. But we really have to have another paradigm for making decisions. We can't use the hierarchy that we used to. Complex matters demand that we move faster and we involve everybody. We have to have a leadership and decision model that works in complexity. And we call that agile in leadership, which is what we teach. And this is something that we actually find the background in our Scandinavian North Germanic society going back to the Viking ages, a thousand years. We had a thing where independent people, a thing was a meeting place where independent free people met and made decisions. And although I'm not an expert, I hope to visit and talk to some of you about it. But I understand that there is a similar parallel in older Ukrainian society and certainly in the Cossack society of free men getting together and making decisions for the common good. Instead of the hierarchy, which is more the Tsar and the Mongolian inspiration for the, 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 rule, uh, the, the law of the ruler, this is a different way. This is free people getting together and choosing to do it. And so what we propose, and that's going to be sort of the final uh, stages here, I think I've already run over my time, but normally we say, you know, the hierarchy, a man in the top, some in the middle, gray matter in the bottom, commands go down, reports go up. We do that for compliance and predictability. How could it be differently? We propose to build an organization, a network of circles, collaborative teams, starting with focusing on our customers, building teams that support our customers, building someone relations between the customers and the teams, a supply chain internally. And those of you who know Lean knows this is a value stream. We deliver to each other and we end up delivering to customers. How do we make decisions? Well, we do that by having resolution circles like the things where we meet and decide for the common good. Instead of having the boss tell us, because if people are submitting to a boss, we have the green shifting, we have people tweaking the truth in order to please the boss because he's my, he has my faith in his hands. We have resolution circle where we decide. And we have something that is called secondary circles for people with the same skill sets, but in different teams, getting together and enhancing their skills. And we finally have transient circles for handling the totally unexpected, either a crisis or an opportunity. We have a model for that. There is a way to do this so that we can focus on serving the customer because in the end, that's the only source of revenue here. And we do it in a resilient and sustainable way. And um, so how to react when you get the sudden drops into chaos, the crisis, this is the topic of this uh, talk as well. Re quickly escalate, have people decide who are, the, who are the best people to handle this situation. A state of emergency, we put together a transient circle of the best people. We let them look at the situation and stabilize it. And then they operate and they, they try to stabilize the crisis and get back to some sort of normal. And we all do what we can do to support them. But when it's over, when they've stabilized the situation, the crisis, we're passing out of chaos again, and we disband the, the, the people. We tell them, thank you very much for your help. We appreciate that. But now we go back to normal because we don't want to have a constant crisis um, where people of high authority command all of us. We want to get back to the normal way of making decisions. And um, that was sort of a, a, a very quick tour around it. Apologize for taking a bit too much time, but um, I rest my case here. Hope that was okay, Katarina. Thanks. Thank you so much, Kurt, for your enlightening presentation. Uh, we are very grateful for all your initiatives, yours and the Jail House, for our students, Ukrainian students, for all your efforts, support and time. And I would like to push uh, another, uh, the fourth poll for our audience. 
before today, were you aware of any academic solidarity networks initiatives? And uh, we can see that we have different answers from our audience and uh, no one uh, who was who, who isn't interested in such initiatives and academic solidarity. It's great pleasure. Uh, so let's move on to our th uh, next presentation prepared by Ludmila Ulaeva, uh, the University Third Mission. And let's look to this presentation. Uh, Mila, the floor is yours, please. Okay, hi for all. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you very okay, well. Okay, thanks. Uh, two years ago, I started very interesting in initiative. Uh, I start. I created a uh, own uh, Telegram channel. It was interesting for me in the first month of the war because I am expert in grant in fundraising, crowdfunding, and I started my own initiative when I say people write on the channel how we can uh, uh, get uh, different grants for different initiatives. And uh, now I have 15,000 people on this channel. So it was for me surprise this, uh, that this topic is uh, was uh, is so popular so now i have some community different expert from universities also uh, people who want create good project for reconstruction of ukraine and help our country to do all for help people in very difficult situation and now i have show uh, some my conclusion about the uh, spring this year because I actively participate uh, in different Erasmus Plus projects uh, in higher education in and in other field. Uh, so, for example, this month I uh, submitted about 30 projects only in Erasmus Plus program with different, pro, uh, different partnership uh, when there are many universities from, from all European unions. And I have today some results and uh, some maybe recommendation how we can get money for our project and what problem we have in this process. Uh, for me, uh, now, main my... Um, my way in uh, communication with different universities in the world, it is how we can activate our third missions. And for Ukraine, it is very important because now all universities are looking for resources for project for reconstruction, our economy, our society and our universities. Uh, so when we have look for different resources for our projects. Uh, I uh, think that you are know that we have many different websites, resources, groups, and channels when we can look for different uh, grant, grant calls and programs for uh, university and not only. But I saw that uh, university in Ukraine and also in European countries are very uh, traditionally choose, do very traditional choose. They, uh, in the most situation, work with very famous program, for example, Erasmus Plus, Horizon, but we uh, also can use other very interesting proposition from different um, donors from all the world. Uh, so my uh, recommendation is um, maybe so. Sorry. Uh, okay. My first recommendation is that we need now be more careful and use all possibilities from different donors, not only Erasmus Plus, not only Horizon Europe, but also there are in every country now many calls for financing 
but these calls uh, calls are better because uh, these calls also uh, pay attention to specific situation in every country. For example, we uh, have special calls in in uh, um, Creative Europe uh, from different uh, funds in Ukraine. Special calls how to help people during the war, for example, or for university for reconstruction or for university to buy some infrastructure or creating and other. Uh, the second recommendation, uh, now I also consult different university and all organization, for example, from NGO sectors, how to create project for financing by grants. And I saw the big, um, big uh, um, gap in uh, creating projects when we have not information in project about our target audience and about needs the people whom we want to help in our project. Uh, for example, it's uh, a typical problem in Ukraine, for example, uh, when we use some um, known program and we don't take, uh, pay attention to Erasmus uh, to different grant call when we can uh, get money. Uh, my last uh, good case, it is situation when uh, one small private university in Ukraine, I, I cannot now uh, show the name of this organization because the project us, uh, are, uh, is in the stage of uh, grant agreement process, so only after official end we can show this project for all, but uh, I, we have a small private university in Kyiv. Uh, this university has a strong focus on social mission and they help uh, migrants in Ukraine from different uh, regions of Ukraine. Uh, it is psychology help, also social work, also uh, learning in the university. And this university cannot take part in some call for NGOs. And there, is, there are other organizations. It is a charity fund. And this two organizations, university and NGO fund, they together submit project and get money now for creating a youth center in the Kyiv. So, it is a very good example how universities can combine their efforts for different projects together and to get money for some reconstruction project in Ukraine. So very good case uh, from my last practice. Uh, and uh, also we need to be very careful when we uh, submit some project to some grant program, we want to get big sum, big budget, but you, uh, we need to be very careful with, with this. Why? Because sometimes it's simpler and more effective to apply for a small grant, but why? For example, compare some a few polls in Erasmus Plus. Uh, very famous call. It is a type of the project in Erasmus Plus. It is capacity building in higher education. But this uh, project is this type of the project. It's very difficult uh, in all process in uh, writing proposition, pro proposal, in implementation of project, in reporting, and we have a big competitiveness in this call. For example, you can get uh, about eight uh, uh, or six uh, thousand euros for budget, but in the most situation, it is very big partnership. It's difficult to manage it. And also for one person, it can be only 40, 60,000 euro. Well, also there are very interesting and very simple in preparation, uh, other type of the project, cooperation partnership in higher education, but also in the field of school education, uh, adult education, sport and other, and university can be in all type of this cooperation partnership. 
And on the first vision, it's only, for example, uh, 250,000 uh, uh, euros for all budget. But for every organization, it is the same sum as in the bigger project, capacity building. So uh, sometimes we don't understand that small projects also are very effective and it's uh, also can be good example how to revise different projects and social initiatives for universities. Uh, also, there are big problems when we, uh, for example, in Ukraine, have a small organization or have private universities without good grant experience. So we need to start. And it's typical mistake, not only in Ukraine, because now I am working uh, with uh, different organizations from uh, 25 countries, from all uh, the world. And I saw that it's typical mistake when small organizations want uh, to get very big budget, but this organization have not maybe financial capacity uh, and uh, other resources and team also to get this big budget. And this organization can submit very good project with high level project with very good quality, but uh, this project will be reject because organization cannot uh, capacity to manage this big project. Uh, also, other problems that I saw that uh, sometimes organization have very good idea to the project and uh, management of this organization sometimes want to be leader, coordinator, because it's interesting to be the main person in the project, but we have the same problem that uh, on the first step, grand story, and for small organization, we need to understand that to be coordinator, it also means to be very financially strong organization. So for the first step, or maybe when we have a project with big budget and uh, with uh, uh, big diffic difficult management system, we need to go to the more um, more experienced organization and it's better when coordinator is other organization for example from European Union with big experience and uh, with more stable situation also we have now the war in Ukraine and sometimes in the international projects, it's better when the center of management is in other country, not in Ukraine. It is for uh, European Union funded uh, project. Uh, and about analysis, and I started to say about this, but uh, I need to um, uh, maybe say about this special part of my uh, speech because in many rejected project because I have very big uh, stories in submission project and revising for example only now I am manager in about 15 Erasmus plus project uh, but at the same time I have big uh, number of project when I am researcher for example or author of idea and other uh, so uh, sometimes the main problem with project application is that we have not strong understanding about what needs we will um, help uh, people with what needs. And uh, sometimes we as researcher think that only in the, our project we will do some research. And for example, some research can be as special working package in our project, but when we uh, submit our project, we also can need to show that we conducted our own research of our um, target groups. 
For example, it can be some focus groups, online survey, interviews, group discussion, uh, what we did before submission project. And we need to put this information in our project applications. Uh, it seems that we understand that we need to do, but my practice uh, said that in the many project authors uh, don't include this information. At, uh, and as a result, our application and our project can be um, not get fi uh, finance because in this reason. Also, my one recommendation we need do uh, more for our sustainability. For example, if a few years it was important, but some expert who uh, evaluate our project uh, can um, maybe give um, not so much attention for this, but now sustainability, it is one of the main reasons why we can get funding. And also, I uh, I saw this problem, uh, and we have two situations. One situation, we sometimes uh, write in the project many information about sustainability, and we think maybe after this project, who can check what we to do from our proposal, but we need to uh, be very careful about this and write in the project only real work we can do in real life. And we have other situation, typical situation where we, when we have only some um, uh, typical non-concrete information about sustainability. But what is sustainability? We need to show that project can give positive results and after finishing the project. Uh, so what we can write in the project application we need to give answer uh, un uh, answers for the following question what are the planet sources of funding after the project finishing how can the project be scaled other organization different sectors other target audience how do we plan for the development of the project after its complexion how will the project result be used by grantee in other project activities. How will you ensure the availability of project results for wide audience? Will new partnership specific cooperation created in the project? Will you ensure impact long-term effects of the project? So we need to give this information and write this information in our project to be successful and get Funding. And my maybe good news on the uh, as the last uh, slide, it is um, that for newcomers, we also have good possibilities in uh, different Erasmus EU uh, grants uh, program. For example, we have a special competitions for organization with a small experience in grant field. Uh, in Europe, it can be example when we have a small cooperation a project in Erasmus Plus. Or, for example, in many grant uh, calls, we have special rules when partnership need to combine experienced partners and newcomers. So now we have good possibilities for Ukrainian organization to go to these projects and to get funding for Ukraine for some reconstruction and to support the university activities for local communities. Also, it's very good. Uh, uh, I have very good and many examples when Ukrainian organization NGOs, universities start the first step in grants and now for oh, Ukrainian I'm sorry. it's I'm okay, sorry, okay, okay. I understand about yeah. the line thanks timing okay and now we have a special priorities in many calls from European uh, grants when there are special priority for Ukraine so we can and need to go project with focus on the Ukraine and our difficult, difficult situation. Okay, thanks, that's all.